as is our custom, we always pause during the appointed times and meditate on the passages relevant to that appointed time and try to decipher what this particular passage tells us about our Messiah, our Mashiach, specifically, what does it tell us about something that he's already accomplished? And sometimes it is about something that he is yet to accomplish. Um, and the fall feasts are those that we believe are pointing to the future work of Messiah. And in some cases, it is a little bit of both. It is what he has already fulfilled, but then awaiting its greater fulfillment completion. So today is appointed time, um, even though strictly speaking, it is behind us, the day has passed, but we're going to meditate on Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the service, has something that has already been fulfilled, even though it's anticipating a greater fulfillment. So today's focus is mostly going to be on what has been already accomplished in Yom Kippur. And if you wanted to do a personal study on all of the passages which speak of this appointed time, this Moed, Moed is the word for appointed time in Hebrew. If you wanted to do a study, I'll quickly give you a listing of the references. You can note them down and and study them and, and meditate on them because we won't obviously have time to look at all of the passages in detail. Um, so I'll quickly list them and then we'll move on. Exodus 30, 10, Leviticus 23, 26 to 32, Leviticus 16, the entire chapter, Leviticus 25, which is the chapter on Jubilee, and last is Numbers 29, 7 through 11. Okay. So I want to start off with a quick summary of what Yom Kippur is, and then we'll dive into specific passages and verses. Um, so, so what happens during Yom Kippur? Or what happened in the past when the temple was standing and where there was an ironic priesthood functioning? What happened during those days? So once a year, not, not more than once, but one exactly one time a year, the Kohen Gadol, that is the high priest, who is from the line of Aaron. He has to be a physical descendant of Aaron. He enters into the most holy place to do certain things. What is that? To make atonement for himself, his family, and the entire assembly of Israel. For example, Exodus 30, 10 says, Aaron is to make atonement upon, upon the horns of the altar once a year with the blood of the sin offering throughout your generations. Uh, Leviticus 26, or sorry, Leviticus 16, 17 says, nobody is to be in the meeting tent when he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he goes out, referring to Aaron. And he has made atonement on his behalf, on behalf of his household, and on behalf of the whole assembly of Israel. Now, in traditional Judaism, uh, those who are following rabbinic Judaism, Yom Kippur for them is the culmination of what they refer to as the 10 days of awe. In Hebrew, Yamim Naraim. So it's 10 days of deep introspection, uh, repentance, and seeking the Lord for forgiveness, and specifically um, the sign of the forgiveness being offered to his people would be that their names would be inscribed in the book of life for one more year. And it actually has an expiration date. It expires at the end of the year and you have to start all over again. Um, it's the most somber day for uh, the Jewish people who follow rabbinic Judaism, where they're repenting and asking for forgiveness and hope to be inscribed in the book of life uh, until the next Yom Kippur. So that is just the traditional observance within the world of rabbinic Judaism. It is interesting that those who, um, Jews and Gentiles who are believers in Yeshua, they kind of struggle with Yom Kippur a little bit because we know our names are inscribed in the book of life. We don't need our high priest to go again and make the sacrifice because we know Yeshua has 
made that perfect sacrifice once for all, uh, for all of our sins. So, you know, what, how exactly or what, what do you do? And I know many believers, myself included, we use that day to um, also repent and fast and pray, uh, interceding for those who are yet to come into the household of God. So that's the time that we spend in time, prayer and fasting, um, or at least it's, it's available to us um, to enter into that uh, intercession for those who have not come into the family of God yet. So where does the term Yom Kippur come from? So we are all familiar with the term Yom Kippur. Um, and nowadays, even schools close for Yom Kippur. Um, and, and we know Yom Kippur, uh, at least there is an understanding in the popular culture that Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. I think everybody knows that. Um, but we look at what exactly does Yom Kippur mean. Uh, Leviticus 23, 26 to 28. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, however, the 10th day of this seventh month is Yom Kippur. And if you read the Tanakh, it actually says Yom HaKippurim. It doesn't say Yom Kippur, it says Yom HaKippurim. And we'll come back to why it says Kippurim in a second, but I just want to read the passage first. It is a holy convocation to you, meaning, meaning it's a set apart sacred assembly, and you are to afflict or humble your souls that's the term, not humble yourself, humble your souls or afflict your souls. You are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. You are not to do any kind of work on that set day for it is Yom Kippurim. In the Tanakh, it says Yom Kippurim to make atonement for you before Adonai, your God. And those of you who've been studying with us, you know, Kippurim is the plural of Kippur. So there's a question, why is it the plural form? And we'll get to that uh, eventually in this message. So the first question is, what is the purpose of this day? What is the purpose of Yom Kippur? Uh, the short answer is for the removal of sins. So here are three verses that I will give you to show that it is actually for the removal of sins. Leviticus 23, 28. You are not to do any kind of work on that said day, for it is Yom Kippurim to make atonement for you before Adonai your God. Leviticus 16.30 says, for on, for on this day atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. From all your sins, you'll be clean before Adonai. Leviticus 16.34 says, this will be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for B'nai Israel that is children of Israel, once in the year because of all their sins. So it is clear that Yom Kippur has to do with the removal of sins. And uh, there is a um, very good physical picture of the removal of sins that is shown, uh, that is exemplified in the Yom Kippur service, uh, which is detailed in Leviticus 16, and I recommend that all of us read Leviticus 16. It's an amazing passage, just showing the whole service that the priest, the high priest performs during that one day uh, in the year for all of Israel and how exactly atonement is effected. Um, and so I'm gonna read from Leviticus 16 uh, to show you a mental, uh, so that you have a mental picture of how exactly the sins are removed. So keep in mind, Aaron is the high priest, and he is the only one qualified or his descendants who can enter into uh, the temple that day to make atonement. So verse 21 says, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat. Let me pause quickly. Uh, there are two goats that have been brought in for that service. So there is one goat which is kept alive and the other goat that is sacrificed. And so Aaron lays his head on the live goat verse 21, and confesses over it all the iniquities of B'nai Israel, children of Israel, and all their transgressions, all their sins. He should place them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. So Aaron places his hand, uh, effectively transferring the sins of the people, himself included, onto the goat. And then there is another man who is ready to take the goat 
uh, to the wilderness, into the wilderness. The goat will carry, verse 22, the goat will carry all their iniquities by itself into a solitary land, and he is to leave the goat in the wilderness. The understanding is the goat is taken into the wilderness and left to die. That is the understanding, even though the verse doesn't actually specifically say that. Uh, actually, verse 22 also, um, for emphasis, says the goat will carry all their iniquities by itself. This goat um, is also called, uh, referred to as the scapegoat. This goat is the fall guy, the one who is taking the blame, even though he himself is the innocent one. And who does that remind us of? The one who knew no sin became sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. So he is taking the sin all by himself. That's what the verse says, all their iniquities by itself into a solitary land. Again, pointing to the exclusivity of our mode of salvation, our mode of atonement, that there is no other who is going to carry our sin, not our penance, not our good works, not someone else's prayers on our behalf. It is this innocent one who took upon himself all of our sins, past, present, and future, and he removes it from us. And that's, that is why there is another verse in the word of God, which says, as far as the east is from the west, so has God removed our sins from us. And this is a good visual of the scapegoat who is taking away our sins and removing it from us. Praise be to God. Um, so that is purpose number one, the removal of our sins. There is a second purpose. The, a second purpose is actually, if you read in the English Bible, it says it is for the atoning of the elements of the temple. You would ask, why does the temple elements, why do they need atonement? And the technical language is atonement. Well, I know why I need atonement. Why does the temple need atonement? Okay, so Leviticus 16, verse 15. Then he is to slaughter the goat of the sin offering. Remember I said there are two goats and uh, one goat is cast away, the scapegoat cast away into the wilderness after the sins of the people have been transferred to him. But the other goat is a sacrifice. And so that's the goat in view in this verse, verse 15. And so this is the goat for the sin offering. So it says, slaughter the goat for this, of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood behind the curtain. So you're now entering into the Holy of Holies. And do with its uh, as, uh, bring its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did. And do with, do with its blood as he did with the blood of the, of the bull. Sprinkle it upon the atonement cover. Uh, another word for the atonement cover is the mercy seat. So now what's, what you have to imagine, or the visual is the Ark of the Covenant, and there is a, a lid that the Ark of the Covenant has, and on two ends of the lid are the two uh, cherubs, or in Hebrew you would say keruv, the two cheruvim on either side of this lid, uh, kind of looking down on the mercy seat and covering with the mercy seat with their wings. And so that's the mental picture. Um, and so, so sprinkle upon the atonement cover or the mercy seat and before the atonement cover. So sprinkle upon and before it, um, verse 16. So, and so he is to make atonement for the holy place. So this is atonement for the holy place. Because, and the, here's the reason why he needs to make atonement for the holy place. Because of the uncleanness of B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions, all their sins. So there is an atonement that needs to be accomplished for the holy place and other elements of the temple because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And we haven't answered the question why this is necessary. All we are told in the Torah is, you shall do this. Continuing, verse 16, it says, he is to do the same for the tent of meeting. In other words, what Aaron just did, the atoning for the, um, the mercy seat, he is to do the same for the tent of meeting, 
which dwells with them in the midst of their impurities. And then it says, and there is another verse which says, he is also to do this for the altar, um, which I'm not reading that verse, but there's also the atonement for the altar. And only then, in verse 20, it says, when he has finished atoning for the holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, only then is, is he to present the live goat, the scapegoat. So first atone for everything, all the elements of the temple, the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, and then verse 21, it says, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of B'nai Israel and their transgressions, all their sins. And then they send off that goat. Why do we need the atoning of the temple? Why wasn't it sufficient to send, to transfer our sins onto the scapegoat and send it away? If that's all that was done, what would have been accomplished? We would have been uh, absolved of our guilt. All the sins would have been removed from us. But God is showing something even greater here. If the temple elements have not been atoned for, you cannot enter into that place. The atoning work has to be done for all the elements. So now you can enter into even the Holy of Holies because the blood has done the atoning work. God is not simply interested in uh, forgiving our sins. He's interested in communing with us. He's interested in communing with us like it was in the garden before sin came into this world. So the picture of the high priest coming into the Holy of Holies is actually a picture of that communion being restored. And so if I have to enter into that Holy of Holies only through the blood, can I enter into that secret place, the most holy place of Adonai? Without the blood, I can't enter into that place. So that's why you have these two goats. One goat by whose blood I'm able to enter into the Holy of Holies. In fact, we had that worship song. I enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of the Lamb. And the other goat signifies my sins being removed from me. Both are important. So another reason why the um, blood is important, which is actually it's the same, same reason, but I wanted to unpack that a little bit more. What would happen if there is no atonement? There is no, cover, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a different um, word picture of the term atonement in a second, but think of the atonement for now as a, a covering, like a buffer. A buffer is a good, a good term, actually. Um, why is this buffer required? Verse 16, 11. Aaron is to present the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and so make atonement for himself and his house. He is to slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He is to take a fire pan full of coals, a fire from off the altar before Adonai, plus two handfuls of sweet powdered incense and bring it within the curtain. Now pay attention to the incense also. It says, verse 13, he is to put the incense on the fire before Adonai so that the cloud of the incense may cover the atonement seat that is on the ark. So the incense is another kind of buffer. It says the cloud of the incense, you have to make this incense so that the cloud of the incense may cover the atonement seat that is on the ark. For what? So that he would not die. Who? Aaron. Aaron, who is representing the people. He's representing the, the high priest, ultimately Yeshua, really. He's representing us when he enters into the Holy of Holies. And the high priest who has taken our sins upon him cannot enter into that place unless the cloud of the incense is present. The cloud of the incense is, again, a buffer. Uh, why do we need a buffer? Buffer from whom? Buffer from the Lord God. Because the Lord God makes himself manifest, his Shekhinah manifest over the atonement seat. He appears there. And we know this from other passages. 
And so if he is appearing there, I cannot also appear in that same place without a, a safety buffer. And the buffer in this case is mentioned as the incense, but the same with the blood. Okay, so we talked about the two purposes, the removal of sins, and also that, so that we can enter into the Holy of Holies, have that communion with God. So as I mentioned early on, the, the phrase that you see in the Bible, the Tanakh, is not Yom Kippur, even though we refer to this Moed as Yom Kippur. It is Yom Kippurim. Kippurim is the plural of Kippur. And we've been translating Kippurim as atonement. So that, that, that's, that's a reasonable translation and, and sufficient for us to have a working definition of Kippurim. Uh, but we'll, we'll dig a little deeper into what that word literally means. And we'll also answer the question, why is the plural form of Kippur used? Why, why isn't it Kippur uh, and why is it Kippurim? So first thing, what does Kippur mean? The word that's translated as atonement. We all assume certain things when it talks about atonement, but what does the word actually mean? So the root word, the, the noun form in Hebrew is kofer. Kofer means a ransom, the price of a life. I'll give you an example from Exodus 21, 29, 30, which uses the word kofer from which we get the word kippur. So this is... Um, what happens if your animal hurts somebody, specifically your ox? What is, what is the Torah instruction if that were to happen? If the ox was given to goring in times past and the warning has been given to its owner, yet he has not kept it pent up and has killed, and it has killed a man or a woman, then the ox must be stoned and its owner must also be put to death. So if you have an animal that you know is causing trouble and injuring people, it's your responsibility to keep it, um, you know, uh, keep it where it can't hurt anybody. You're responsible because you know this ox or this animal is prone to doing it, and therefore you're, you're held accountable. So it says, if this ox then hurts somebody, the ox must be stoned, and also the owner must be put to death. But there is an exception clause. If instead of the owner being put to death, there is a ransom placed on him, then he is to pay for the redemption of the life of that was destroyed, and he is set free. He is absolved of that guilt. So the word for ransom is kofer. So his life was now held in uh, subjectivity to the holy laws of God, which says, you are guilty. So he, he, he is, he's, in a, he's in a cell. He is, he's in the holding cell um, in the courtroom of God. He cannot escape unless there is a ransom paid. Someone comes and pays a ransom, then he can walk. And so the word for ransom is kofer, from which we get the word kippur. So the idea of atonement, Yom Kippur being one who is going to come and rescue us by paying the price for our life, the life which is held. Um, because the life which is now, because it's guilty, is held in a prison and cannot be set free, is now, because of this ransom payment, you're able to walk. So that is the picture. I also want to look at the word form of uh, Kippur, and that is the, the word kafer. Kof, kafer was noun, kafer is the word form. So what is the word form uh, tell us? So kofer, um, sorry, kofer, uh, you, you, again, you get a good um, action picture. The, the meaning is to cover over something or to pacify, to appease, to satisfy, to make propitiation. So you have all these mental pictures from the, of the word kofer. Um, at a minimum, you can think of somehow making good. There was a demand that was upon you. That demand has been met. So that's kafir. And what is that demand that's being met on Yom Kippur for us? The demands of the holy laws of God are that we should be stoned to death for our sins. That we should, uh, to put it in, in, in other words, uh, we should, you know, you're condemned to hell for all eternity. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Um, 
one in the natural, the other in the spiritual sense or eternal sense. And now it is the, the kafir says that requirement of the law of God that you owe this, your life is eternally owed in payment for your guilt, for your sin, that has been met. In other words, somebody came and made the bail payment for you. And so now you can walk. You're free to go. There was an interesting ref reference to the same word uh, from which we get Kippur. That root word appears for the first time in an interesting account, which is actually the account of the flood, Genesis 6. And it's interesting how it shows up here. It says, the earth was ruined before God, so Genesis 6, 11, and the earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth and behold, it was ruined because all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. God saw the earth and behold, it was ruined because, um, oh, next verse, verse 13. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh is coming before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Behold, I'm making, I'm about to bring ruin upon them along with the land. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with compartments and cover it. The word for cover is kafar. Both inside and outside with something, right? And various Bible translations say pitch. But the word for pitch is kofer. So cover it, cover the ark, kafar it with kofer. So cover it with the ransom payment. Fascinating. And then what does God say to those who enter into the ark, contrasting them with those who are on the outside? Verse 17, now I'm about to bring the flood water upon the land to destroy all the flesh in which is the spirit of life from under the sky. Everything that is on the land will perish. Who is that? Everybody who is on the outside, who do not have the kafir, they will perish. But I, verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you. So you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. The eight who were rescued from all of humanity, the eight who were rescued were covered by the covering that pays for life, by the ransom. So in the natural, it seems like some substance was, some sealant was covering the ark. But if you look at the spiritual meaning, it's the same word for Kippur. Cover it, kafar is the word, with kofer. Kafar it with kofer. So pacify, right? Kafer is pacify and kofer is ransom. So everybody who was rescued, the picture of the ark is the same as the picture of Yom Kippur. One, uh, the picture is that God is making atonement for the ones who have entered into his ark, who are covered by him. And that covering is that which separates them from the world. The world does not have the covering, and so they will perish. Everybody who is inside the ark have the covering. So same picture as in Leviticus 16. Remember, Noah happens way before Moses and everything else, the Torah that was given, right? Um, okay, so you see that same visual, that same spiritual idea there in Genesis 6. So practically, again, what does the word Kippur mean from all of uh, these uh, words that we've looked at, the root meaning? What does it mean in a practical sense? The practical sense is, to appease or satisfy the just demands of a holy God by whose standards, if we are judged, we are all found guilty, each and every one of us. So the justice of God demands a proper accounting. Either we pay, pay for it ourselves, which is a life sentence, no getting out of jail, or another one pays for it in our stead. And he is our redeemer. He is the scapegoat. He is the fall guy. And we know who he is. He's Yeshua. So. When we talk about Yom Kippur and the goat who was sacrificed and whose blood was sprinkled upon the various elements of the Beit HaMikdash, 
That is Yeshua's blood that has already been sprinkled. It has been already accomplished. You're not awaiting its accomplishment. It has already been accomplished. His blood was poured, according to the book of Hebrews, in the heavenly holy of holies mercy seat. And we'll look at that passage in a second. So now that, that brings us from the understanding of what Kippur means to, we'll, we'll now look at the mercy seat itself. I mean, why is the mercy seat called the mercy seat? What is the mercy seat? It's simply the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Why is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant called the mercy seat? So the Ark of the Covenant was, it was uh, in the portable sanctuary while the, the Israelites were, were traveling, uh, wandering in the wilderness, and later it became a permanent house of God. Um, it was within the permanent house of God, the, the one Solomon built, the first temple in Jerusalem. Uh, in either, either case, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant was made from a solid piece of gold. And this angel, this particular type of angel called a cherub, was placed at each end of the cover, and the space between the cheruvim, or the cherubim in English, was called the mercy seat because it had a special purpose. Why is this lid, the space between the two cheruvim, called the mercy seat? The mercy seat was special because, one, it was the place God's glory appeared when he wanted to communicate with Israel. It is the symbol of God. It is a symbol of the divine presence, sometimes known as the Shekhinah, the symbol of the divine presence that appeared over this seat, over the, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And we can see, these, uh, see that idea in these two verses, Exodus 25, 22. Uh, it says, I will meet with you there. I will speak with you from above the atonement cover, from above this lid, from between the two cherubim that are on the Ark of the Testimony, about all that I will command you for B'nai Israel. But God wanted to come and communicate and teach Israel on how to live as God's people. That's where he made his presence known. And then Moses was to come and meet with God, and God was showing up in that meeting place. And that's why it's also known as a tent of meeting. But specifically, God's presence was localized upon the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And also from Leviticus 16, which is a passage on Yom Kippur, it says in verse 2, uh, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come just at any time into the holiest place behind the curtain before the atonement cover, which is on the ark, so that he would not die. For I will be appearing in the cloud over the atonement cover. So there's the place of God making himself manifest. It is the place of God's presence. Today, since the new covenant has been inaugurated, where is the place of God's presence? Where does he make himself appear? Uh, on the earth, he dwells in us, Emmanuel, through his spirit. His spirit dwells in us. But back then, there was a separation. They had to come to the temple, and within the temple, they had to come to the Holy of Holies to encounter the presence of God. What an amazing thing. How blessed are we that God has now come and come to dwell within us through Yeshua. Praise be to Yeshua. So if you thought the days of the temple were an amazing thing, we do not know, we do not fully understand, we do not grasp this amazing reality of God. The God into whose presence a human could not enter unless he was properly atoned for. That God is now resident within you and me. What an amazing thing. And think of the other side of that coin, which is what an amazing responsibility that we have as we're carrying his presence. You and I are like the Ark of the Covenant today. Holy, set apart for his purposes. God is dwelling in us. How much more careful should we be in the things that we think about, the things that we see, the things that we consume, everything that we do, because the very presence of God is in us. Hebrews 13. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a verse that shows, that makes clear that Yeshua is actually the fulfillment of that goat that was offered to Adonai as a sacrifice, that Yeshua is that goat. So let's look at Hebrews 13. Actually, let me look at Leviticus 16 first. 
as to what happens to that goat that was sacrificed. And then we look at Hebrews 13. So Leviticus 16, I'll read this one more time from verse 27. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, should be carried outside the camp and their hides, their flesh, and their dung burned with fire. So this goat was sacrificed. He should be taken outside the camp not within the temple, not within their dwelling place, but outside. And what, what is to be done to him outside? Completely destroyed. Like it should be the end of this goat. Picture of Yeshua in Hebrews 13, verse 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holies by the Kohen Gadol as an offering for sin, which is, by the way, a reference to Leviticus 16. That's Hebrews 13, 11. So the blood that is brought into the Holy of Holies by the high priest is an offering for sin. It says in verse 11 of Hebrews 13, that the bodies of those animals are to be burned outside the camp. What is it referring to? It's referring to Leviticus 16, 27. And then Hebrews 13, the next verse, verse 12 says, Therefore, to make the people holy through his own blood, Yeshua also suffered outside the gate. So the author of Hebrews is making clear that this goat is really pointing to the work of Yeshua, who was put to death outside the dwelling place of Israel, outside the temple. And that is why elsewhere in Hebrews it says, it is not the blood of the bulls and the goats that accomplished the removal of sins, but it is the blood of Yeshua. Because that goat in the Yom Kippur service really point to Yeshua. And it is his blood that is the atonement, that is the covering, that is the one that appeases and satisfies the just demands of the Holy God. When you and I were the ones who were condemned, his blood makes the appeasement. Romans 3, 23 to 26, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You all know this verse. They are set right as a gift of his grace to the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua. God set, verse 25, God set forth Yeshua as an atonement through faith in his blood to show his righteousness in passing over sins already committed. Through God's forbearance, he demonstrates his righteousness at the present time that he himself is just and also the justifier of the one who puts in his trust in Yeshua. That verse 25, where it says God set forth Yeshua as an atonement, is actually using the same word in Greek that is equivalent to the mercy seat in Leviticus 16 and the rest of the Torah. How do we know this? Well, we look at the Septuagint. The Septuagint uses the word hilasterion in Greek to refer to the mercy seat. And the word hilasterion is the same word that appears in Romans 3.25 when it says Yeshua is presented as our atonement. Yeshua is presented as our mercy seat. The one who makes the, well, well let me be very clear. He is the one who makes the lid of the Ark of the Covenant a mercy seat. He's the one who makes the seat a mercy seat. So, in other words, Yeshua is not strictly becoming the mercy seat. It's more like Yeshua activates the seat, the lid of the ark, to become the mercy seat by sprinkling his blood upon the heavenly mercy seat. The lid of the ark then becomes the mercy seat when his blood is sprinkled on it. And remember, God also appears there and God is now God's holy laws, the just demands of his, God, uh, of his uh, laws are satisfied the, by the blood of the substitute when he sees the blood on that mercy seat. So God shows up, the holy God shows up, and the blood of the innocent one is on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And so now it has to become the place where God is now offering mercy or can offer mercy because of the blood that is there, because of the blood that appeases, the blood that becomes our propitiation. So Yeshua has become our atonement. 
And the, by the way, the mercy seat, uh, if you look at the word in Tanakh, it is kaporet, same word, kippur, kafar, kofer, all the same root word. The mercy seat is called the kaporet. It's, it's like the covering. That's what it means. It's the covering. It's the one that covers up the guilt. Um, in Hebrews 10, verse 1, it says, the Torah has a shadow of the good things to come, not the form itself of the realities. For this reason, it can never, by means of the same sacrifices offered constantly year after year, in reference to Yom Kippur and other sacrifices uh, during other times, it cannot, by these sacrifices that are offered year after year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshippers cleansed once and for all would no longer have consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, the ones that are offered year after year, is a reminder of sins year after year. Verse 4, for it, is, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So it's contrasting the service offered by Aaron and the sons, the Levitical priesthood, what that was able to accomplish versus what Yeshua is able to accomplish. Now, what does it say about Yeshua's service in the temple? In verse 8, it says, After saying about sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor did you delight in them. Then he said, Behold, I come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second, meaning the requirements according to the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, to establish the second, meaning the new covenant prophesied by Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. And it says in verse 10, by his will, we have been made holy through the offering of the body of Messiah Yeshua once for all. One time sacrifice that was effectual for all time. Verse 11, indeed, every Kohen stands day by day serving and offering the same sacrifice again and again, which can never take away sins. Again, jumping back to the Aaronic priesthood. Verse 12, but on the other hand, when this one offered all, for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from then on until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. Interesting, it's, uh, it's speaking of the, the end of days, the last days here, in the context of contrasting Yeshua's sacrifice and the ironic priesthood, their sacrifices. So it says Yeshua is waiting, and he's going to, he's waiting uh, for the enemies, for God, uh, for his enemies to be made a footstool for his feet. And when the enemies are made uh, ready as a footstool, then he will come and he will trample upon them and destroy them. That's the picture. So it's uh, interesting. In the middle of this passage, there's an allusion to what Yeshua is going to accomplish in the future. Continuing in Hebrews 10, verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those being made holy. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant I will cut with them. For after those days, says Adonai, I will put my law upon their hearts and upon their minds I will write it. Then he says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Why is he able to say this? Why is God able to say this? Because, remember the picture of the scapegoat who took the sins away? The sins are taken away. God cannot remember the sins anymore. Yeshua became our scapegoat and took our sins away. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. God cannot remember our sins. What an amazing thing. <laughs> I've referred to this in the past as the perfect delete button. Delete, forgotten forever. No one's going to recover that stuff. Um, Hebrews 9, again, contrasting Yeshua's sacrifice, which was effectual once for all, perfect sacrifice. And um, so here it is, uh, Hebrews 9, uh, verses 25 on. And he did not offer himself again and again as the Kohen Gadol, who enters into the Holy of Holies year after year with the blood that is not his own. For when he would have needed, for then he would have needed to suffer again and again from the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has been revealed once for all, and for all at the close of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Oh, that's an interesting verse, uh, which gives us some other information. It says, he has been revealed once and for all 
at the close of the ages. So if you've, been, if you've been wondering, are we in the close of the ages? This verse in Hebrews 9 is saying, when this was, verse was written, when Yeshua came, we are now entering into the close of the age. The last final stage. Yes, it is thousands of years long. It's been 2,000 years. But we are in that final stage. We are in that stage. From the time Mashiach appeared. Verse 27, and just that is appointed for men to die once and after this judge, judgment, so also Messiah was offered once to bear the sins of many. He will appear a second time apart from sin to those eagerly awaiting him for salvation. Again, reminder, Yeshua is coming back. If, if, you're, if your congregation, if your Bible teachers don't talk about Yeshua coming back, look, it's all over. There's no questioning, is he coming back or not? It's, and we've looked at other passages in the past, but he is coming back. It's not just us disappearing, pie in the sky kind of thing. He is coming back. Uh, I want to give you some more verses which contrast the earthly versus the heavenly holy of holies. Hebrews 9, 3 to 5. For even when the first one had regulation for worship and the earthly sanctuary, for a tent was prepared in the outer part where the menorah, the table, and the presentation of the bread. This is called the holy place. Again, all of this reference to the temple that was, uh, the first temple that was built and its design, the design for which was given through Moses. Um, Beyond the second curtain was a dwelling called the Holy of Holies. It held a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant completely covered with gold. In the Ark was a golden jar uh, holding what? The manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the, of the covenant. And above it, the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. So that is the picture of the earthly Holy of Holies. Contrast this with the Holy of Holies that Yeshua entered into. Hebrews 9 verse 11. But when Messiah appeared as Kohen Gadol, meaning high priest, of the good things that have now come, it is, it is uh, in the past tense for the author of Hebrews because he has just witnessed all of this when Yeshua laid down his life at the cross. So he's saying, now that the good things have come, when Yeshua appeared as the high priest, not, not the descendants of Aaron, Yeshua, and he says, he passed through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands. Wow. Did you understand? Did you, did you notice that when Yeshua laid down his life, he actually entered a tent? We, can't, we didn't see this in the, in the physical, in the natural, but Yeshua in the spiritual realm entered a more perfect tent, which is not made with hands. So there was one that was made with hands that was standing on earth, the one that was built by Solomon, and the one before that, the portable uh, uh, sanctuary, which traveled with them in, the, in their sojourning in the days of the wilderness. But now it's saying all of that is only a copy of the true one, which is in the heavens. That's what the illusion here is, or the reference. Uh, verse 12, he, Yeshua, entered into that holy of holies once for all not by the blood of boats and calves but by his own blood having obtained eternal redemption for messiah did not enter into holies made with hands which are counterparts of the true things or copies of the true things but into heaven itself now to appear in god's presence on our behalf so whatever picture we had in the earthly tent where god is manifest uh, on the seat of the uh, ark of the covenant and the blood is sprinkled on there by the ironic uh, priest, the Kohen Haggadol. Picture that happening in the heavenly Holy of Holies with Yeshua's blood, Yeshua being the high priest, and God himself being there and saying, now the just demands of my uh, laws have been satisfied by this blood, which has become the covering, which has become the atonement of, for all who are to put their trust in this high priest whose name is Yeshua. I asked the question early on, why is it Kippurim and not Kippur? So Kippurim, which we understand is now Kippur, Kippurim, is a covering, is the buffer. So we need a covering for um, which of our sins? <laughs> All of our sins. And how many sins do we have? More than one. Definitely. No one's going to argue that, right? So we need a covering for each of our sins in a perfect court of law. It's not good enough to go into the court and say, 
uh, judge, I paid the ticket for the traffic violation of last year. Am I to go free from this courtroom and never come back to it again, even though I may have future infractions? If the justice, justice says yes, that is not a just system, is it? No, you paid for that ticket, but now you have other violations. You need to come back here and pay for those. So you need a covering for every single infraction. We have many infractions. We need coverings in that sense, even though Yeshua is only going into the heavenly holy of holies and making this one-time sacrifice, but it is a perfect, complete, comprehensive covering for all of your sins, and hence the word Kippurim and not Kippur. We have a multitude of sins accumulated over a lifetime, and each one of them needed to, needs to be accounted for in a perfect accounting system, and God's accounting system is perfect. Yeshua covered each one of them in his once and for all perfect atoning work. Um, it's interesting. Uh, there are some New Covenant passages which talks about the plurality of our sins. Uh, James 5.20, let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4.8, above all, keep your lo love for one another constant, for love covers a multitude of sins. We need a kippurim, not just a Kippur. So strictly speaking, the day should be called Yom HaKippurim. That's something new um, that I that just came, came to me uh, as, as I'm preparing and I'm speaking about this. It should be Yom HaKippurim. That's, that's what God says. That's the phrase that God uses, Yom HaKippurim. All right, so I'm going to end with an um, interesting account in the Talmud about the efficacy of the Yom Kippur service. Efficacy meaning, did the Yom Kippur service this year when our high priest, whoever the designated high priest, descendant of Aaron, when he went into the temple, uh, did that accomplish for Israel? Imagine we, we are part of Israel and we were living back in the days of uh, when the temple was standing. All the people are waiting. Did our high priest service on Yom Kippurim achieve for us the forgiveness of sins? Yes or no, right? So this was a big deal. Every year, this particular day, all of Israel was waiting for their sins to be removed. So the priest goes in, does his stuff, and we're all waiting for him to come out and see what happens. How do you know whether it was effectual or not? So interestingly, there was a tradition um, among the Jewish people, which is recorded for us in no other, no less document than the Talmud itself, it's in the Talmud uh, tractate Yoma 39b. Yoma, by the way, is related to the word Yom. Yom means day. So Yoma is like saying the day. So when it says, when the, uh, the Hebrew people said Yoma, it's referring to the day, which means the day of atonement. Just like when you know, there's another reference when it says the feast. What is the feast? You know, there are many feasts. When you simply say Chag, which is a Hebrew word for feast, the Chag, which one is it? Which feast is it? It is Sukkot. And Sukkot is coming up. We'll talk about Sukkot later on. Um, not today. But so Yoma is all, the tractate Yoma, which is a, uh, 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 you can think of that as an organization of the Talmud. So a section of the Talmud, which deals with the day, is dealing with Yom Kippur. So here's what it says in tractate Yoma 39b. A, B just means different sides of the page. All right, so the sages taught the following to Israel. During the lifetime of an individual called Shimon HaTzadik, who was a high priest, meaning uh, Shimon HaTzadik means Shimon the, Simon the Righteous. During his lifetime, the lot which was cast for the goat that went uh, was for Adonai, for the Lord, which was the goat that was sacrificed, as opposed to the other goat which sent, us, pushed, uh, sent off into the wilderness, the scapegoat. So the lot which fell for the goat of um, unto, the goat that was unto Adonai, if that showed up in the high priest's right hand as opposed to the left hand, that was a good sign. That was a sign that, okay, this year's sacrifice is going to work for us, guys. 
Um, so whenever Shimon HaTzadik was operating and functioning as the high priest during the Yom Kippur service, that's what happened. After his death, sometimes it did, sometimes it did not. And says, during the 40 years prior to the destruction of the second temple, when was the second temple destroyed? It was destroyed by the Romans under the leadership of Titus in the year 70. So it says 40 years before, which gets us to roughly the year 30 when Yeshua was, when Yeshua became our atoning sacrifice. So here's what it says. Here's what the Talmud says. What happened from that point on, from which point on, from the time Yeshua was sacrificed? What happened? What happened to these signs? So here's what it says. One, um, the, the lot for the goat that was for Adonai never showed up in the right hand of the priest ever again, like consistently, never. From the year 30 until the temple was destroyed. For 40 years, consistently, it was always saying, it was a bad sign, saying, basically, from their vantage point, who sacrifice not accepted, sacrifice not accepted. Not only this sign, there were a few other signs. Um, so here are some of the other signs. There was a strip of crimson wool that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent off into the wilderness. It did not turn white. So apparently, it used to turn white supernaturally. And when it happened, the people knew, okay, our sins have been removed. But for those 40 years, it never turned white. Two other signs. Um, or actually, one other. Uh, yeah, two other signs. The, there's, a t there's a menorah, there's a lampstand in the temple, right? The westernmost lamp of that temple menorah, it did not burn continually. Ever again. That was supposed to burn continually. It was never supposed, the flame was never supposed to go out. Even though the westernmost uh, lamp is the first one that's lit, miraculously, it was the one that was remained till the end when it was supposed to have gone out first. It remained till the end. So when it remained till the end, it was like, oh, supernatural sign saying uh, the sacrifice has been accepted. But for those 40 years, it did not burn continually. Now, in other words, it went off when you expected it to go out. The last sign was the doors of the sanctuary opened by themselves for these last uh, 40 years. And how they viewed it, how the people viewed it is that this is a sign that the doors would be opened by the enemies of Israel. So all these bad signs, because they knew what the good signs were, the opposite of that happened continuously for 40 years. Meaning from the time that Yeshua became the atoning sacrifice. This is the Talmud, which is amazing, which is an amazing testimony of the work of Yeshua, pointing to the work of Yeshua as being that final, once for all, perfect sacrifice by, by our high priest, not in the temple made of human hands, but in the heavenly holy of holies, once for all. Of perfect sacrifice. In closing, again, looking to the author and perfecter of our faith, Yeshua, the last thing I want to say is that Yeshua, we talked about all the ways Yeshua is different from the Aaronic priesthood. Yeshua is Ben Elohim, son of God, very God of God. Um, his priesthood was not the priesthood that was spoken of in the Mosaic Covenant. The priesthood that was spoken of the Mosaic Covenant was only given to the sons of Aaron. It was an Aaronic priesthood, which was only given to those in the tribe of Levi, the Levites. And the book of Hebrews tells us Yeshua is that high priest today for us who went into the heavenly holy of holies. But we know Yeshua is not from the tribe of Levi. He's not a Levite. He's from the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of Judah. Is this in violation of the Mosaic Covenant? This points out to us that there is a greater 
better covenant, to use the language of the author of Hebrews, that is being offered to us. Something that surpasses the Mosaic covenant, where the priesthood is no longer from the tribe of Levi, but from the order of, or in the order of Melchizedek, a priesthood that is eternal. Melchizedek shows up in the Torah so that one day when Yeshua shows up, we'll know, oh, he is in the order of that priesthood, not the Aaronic priesthood, an eternal priesthood. Yeshua is our true high priest, our true Kohen Hagadol, who is operating in the order of Melchizedek, the eternal priesthood. And so we have confidence, people of God, we have confidence that we don't have to go through this year after year wondering, am I in this year? Am I out? Did I make it? Did I not make it? Yeshua's once for all perfect sacrifice accomplished for us an eternal salvation. Eternal salvation. Also an answer to a question to, to those who think about um, salvation, you know, temporary, can I be in, out? Same, same question. Um, no. His, if you consider his salvation, his accomplishment effectual, if it accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish, it is eternal. Praise be to Yeshua. So next few weeks, we will get into the future fulfillment of Yom HaKippurim. Uh, I said there is the already accomplished, and that was done 2,000 years ago, accomplished 2,000 years ago when Yeshua came, but that's not the complete picture of Yom HaKippurim. So we'll talk about that next time. I'm not sure exactly when that next time is, but uh, let's pray. Huh. Abba, Father, we thank you for sending us our Kohen Hagadol, the one who would enter into the heavenly holy of holies, where the just demands of your laws were satisfied by his precious blood, accounting, perfectly accounting for all of our sins, covering over all of them, covering over our multitude of sins. So Lord, help us to go forth, living out of that reality, living consistently with that truth that all of our sins have been permanently removed from us and that we are a set apart people who are now free now free to be operating in your kingdom as your royal priesthood, to be about your kingdom work. You came to destroy the works of Satan, as it says elsewhere in, in the New Testament, that you came to destroy the works of the devil by becoming our atonement, by redeeming a people, by preparing a bride who is going to be perfect. Thank you, Abba, for sending this one, Yeshua, in the order of Melchizedek, to be our high priest. Praise be to Yeshua. We love you. We worship you. We owe you everything. Take us, use us, as you please, for the advancement and the soon coming kingdom, which belongs to you. Your name, in your name alone. Amen. Hallelujah. Yivarecha Adonai Vaishmarecha. Yair Adonai Panavelecha, Vichunecha. Yisa Adonai Panavelecha, Vayasem Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom through the Sar Shalom. Yeshua, Hu Kohen Hagadol, our high priest. Amen, Amen. Hallelujah.